Hello, everyone. I'm John Graham, and it's my privilege today to introduce to you Daron Asimoglu, who will give the AFA lecture. Before I do the introduction, you may have received, an, if you're a finance professor, you may have received an email today from NORC, and that email contains a link to a survey, the climate survey, working in the finance profession survey, and we encourage you to please fill that survey out. So let me introduce uh, Daron Asimoglu for you today. This is the AFA lecture. And this lecture each year is given by a scholar who doesn't work in finance proper, but who works on the frontiers of finance and uh, we hope stretches um, what finance professors do research on. So Daron, I'm gonna give a very brief professional introduction of Daron because I could go on for 15 minutes easily, but I'll keep it brief so we have more time uh, to hear from Daron, which I'm sure what you're most interested in. Jerome is an outstanding economist. He's an extraordinary public intellectual. He's the MIT Institute Professor of Economics, and he is a prolific researcher. He's had tremendous impact, as I'm sure you know. Jerome works in theory. He works in empirical and applied. Um, a unifying theme uh, across these various areas he works in is the motivation by real world issues and problems. Daron's worked in labor economics, economic growth and development, political economy, networks, technology, crises, and more. So very broad and also very deep and impactful. Uh, he's had dozens and dozens of publications in top economics journals. Honestly, many departments, if they had uh, the number of publications Daron had as an individual, we'd view them as excellent departments. He's very prolific. Um, he's also an award-winning, best-selling author of books, as I'm sure you know through Why Nations Fail, and I encourage you to check out Daron's new book, The Narrow Corridor. When I made up this slide about a week or 10 days ago, Daron had 166,000 Google sites, and I would suspect by the end of this week he might be up to about 170,000 because of the great impact of his work. Daron has won numerous awards for his research, the John Bates Clark, John Bates Clark Medal, the Frontiers and of Knowledge Award, Carnegie Fellowship, LaFont Prize, Global Economy Prize, to mention a few. And for several of these, he's been the youngest economist to ever win these awards. Not only does Daron have an incredible research career, but he has is also uh, contributes to the field through his teaching and service. He has advised a mind boggling 100 or more PhD students. And while that quantity is, is hard to fathom, the quality is there too, as is evidenced from uh, Daron having won MIT's Committed Caring Award, which is a university wide award where grad students pick um, the best mentors and advisors and Daron's won that award also. He is also the fellow of many organizations, the, National Academy of Sciences, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Econometric Society, the European Economic Association, Society of Labor Economists, and the Turkish Academy of Sciences, to name a few. So with that introduction, we're very grateful for Daron spending time with us here today. And Daron, why don't you take it away and tell us about the effects of automation on wages, inequality, and the future of work. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. It's a true honor to be here. It's a great privilege uh, to be selected to give the uh, AFA lecture. Uh, of course, like everything else, it is online, but hopefully we can make the best of it. And I'm going to talk about the effects of technology and automation on the labor market, and more specifically, try to understand how automation is changing the labor market and how we can try to understand it at the micro and the macro level. But, and this is uh, all, this is drawing a lot on joint work that I have done with Pascual Restrepo, who was at Boston University, was a former student of mine and frequent collaborator. Uh, the reason why I think uh, this might be a good topic for an AFA lecture is 
that a lot of the recent changes in income distribution, especially in regards to how capital income is shifting, is of course central to finance, but still poorly understood. And I think what I'm going to talk about could hopefully shed light on them. This picture is probably very well known to many finance faculty and professionals. The share of labor and the share of capital after being roughly constant for about 100 years have been changing quite rapidly since the late 1990s, around 2000. And here I'm showing you the aggregate labor share in the gray line and also the composition adjusted one in the red line. In both cases, you see something in the order of about 10 percentage point decline from the early 1990s to today. So that's a huge change in the factor distribution of income. There are similar trends in many other country economies, including in Latin America and some European economies. But the debate about why this is taking place is still ongoing. There is certainly a lot of capital deepening going on. Many in finance and in macro have written about intangible capital. There's a growing literature on markups or perhaps monopsony power. What I'm going to argue is that to make sense of these trends, we really need to think more deeply about the changing task content of production. And to do so, we actually need to change the way that we think about aggregate production functions or sectoral production functions. So, as a part of this lecture, I'm going to take you through a tour of how to think about the role of technology and productivity in the production process. But before I do that, I want to use the remaining through few minutes I have allotted myself for the introduction in drawing some of the implications of the changes in the nature of the labor markets accompanying this big shift away from labor towards capital. Some of this is well known to the audience, but it still bears repeating because I want to frame the rest of the talk in light of these facts. Around the same time as the capital share has been increasing and the labor share declining, and as I'm going to show you related to it, wage structure in the US has been changing. So what I'm showing here is real wages normalized to zero in 1963 and then followed cumulatively for 10 demographic groups, postgraduate to graduate, some college or associate degrees, high school graduates and graduate high school, less than high school and men and women. And what you see is that it's a remarkable period. And this actually goes back before 1963 if you piece it with other data sources than the uh, May CPS, which is what I'm using here. What you see is a period of shared prosperity, rapid productivity growth going hand in hand with the real wages of all 10 demographic groups increasing pretty much in tandem. But then after about 1980s, you see two remarkable patterns, and both of those are going to be central to what I'm going to talk about. One is that there's a big gap opening up here. This is the wage inequality, which by now commands a very large literature. But equally important and clearly very connected to it is the fact that, especially for low education men, the real wage is declining. So if you're a man, with less than college degree, your real wages today are significantly lower than the real wages of similar workers with similar qualifications 30 years ago. Even for college graduate men, unless they have a postgraduate degree, the labor market hasn't been amazingly good over the last 
30, 40, 30 years or so. They have done much better. The college premium is up compared to high school graduates, but that's precisely because high school graduates have been doing really bad. Because women have been catching up relative to men, the decline in the real wages of women with low educations is not as steep, but you see the inequality and uh, bad labor market performance even for women with low education. Now, the vast majority of the papers on these patterns posit some sort of skill bias technological change. I'm going to argue through a number of arguments that the classic skill bias technological change perspective is not very useful. But as a first salvo in that, I want to show you that, especially over the last two decades, three decades actually, growing demand for skills does not need to does not seem to be a good description of what's going on. So this is from a paper I have in the Handbook of Labor Economics with David Otter. And what it shows is the changes in employment by skill percentile of the occupation. So if you think that what's driving the changes in wage structure are the fact that new technologies, AI, digital technologies, and so on are increasing the demand for skills, and that's really uh, sort of at the root of it, then you should also expect that the employment share of more skilled occupations should increase. And that's more or less what happened in the 1980s. So the red curve here is the 1980s pattern. But by 1990s, things actually are looking pretty different. Instead of the higher skill occupations experiencing greater demand, you have this inverse U-shaped pattern. So this Middle occupations are the one that are are the ones that are contracting. These are clerical occupations, sale occupations, and especially blue collar occupations. And by the 2000s, completely different. A lot of the jobs in the U.S. are from the bottom of the wage distribution. So something much different than the simplest skill bias technological change view. And these trends are not unique to the US. I'm going to show a lot of data from the US, but some there are some elements in this story that are US specific, but the broad technological changes aren't. And one way of seeing that is this picture which shows how the distribution of employment has changed from early 1990s to mid 2000s in much of Europe. And the, or the, 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 the brown, the reddish brown maroon bars are for the middle third of the occupations. Again, the same clerical production blue color occupations I pointed out in the previous figure. And they're all heading south, meaning that they are all contracting in every country. So what I'm gonna do in the rest of this talk is first explain why these facts and a holistic understanding of the changes in the wage structure and the future of labor market requires new theory. And I'll give an overview of that theory in the process also explaining what's wrong with the existing theory in my opinion. And then I'll show you that this theory enables a different way of looking at the data. And I'll show you much more on what's going on in the US and in the process also link both the share, changes in the share of labor and also wage inequality to the nature of new technology. Darun, let me insert myself, sorry to interrupt. I think I forget, forgot to say at the beginning, please enter your questions into the Q&A as time goes on, and Jerome, we've dedicated a lot of time at the end to answer those questions. So anyway, if you're typing them into the Q&A, we will eventually get to them. Thanks, Excuse John. Me. Excuse me. All right. So <clears throat> let's jump into the theory. So what I'm going to argue is that 
to have a satisfactory understanding of modern technologies and for that matter for historical technologies and their impact on productivity and labor demand it is particularly useful to think in terms of tasks what i mean by tasks are the discrete units in the production process that need to be completed so if you need to if you want to have a piece of garment reach the market you know you need to start with uh, spinning and weaving then you need to do designs and the need to do carding and uh, stitching together and then coloring and other chemical processes. Then you need to bring those garments to the market to wholesale and retail and it's all of these tasks are necessary for a piece of clothing to actually reach the consumer. And one way of fruitfully understanding what many technologies do is that they change how different tasks are performed. In particular, by automation, we refer to machines and algorithms performing tasks that were previously performed by humans. This has happened in agriculture, horse-powered reapers, harvesters, threshing machines, and then later tractors replacing manual labor. It's happened in manufacturing early on, machine tools, more recently, industrial robotics, welding machines, assembly and packaging, and quite extensively with software in office work and now increasingly with AI. But also this task-based approach is going to allow us to talk of new tasks that emerge in which labor has a comparative advantage. If you think of most people around you, they perform tasks that did not exist 80 years ago. Even as professors, you know, our occupation of course is very old, but if you think of the tasks that we're performing, including you know, uh, presentations like this that are taking place via Zoom using iPads and the most modern technology, those tasks are qualitatively quite different than what a professor would do 80 or 100 years ago. For many other things like programmers, radiologists, uh, <clears throat> security, computer security, IT personnel, these occupations did not even exist 60 years ago. So this emergence of new tasks is gonna be important as well. Now, you might say, fine, if you want to be detailed, you may talk of these tasks, but I'm just gonna keep with the basic neoclassical framework and I'll try to understand everything by writing a production function of this form. And I'll think of technology either in this AL form, labor augmenting, that's what after all Uzawa taught us, that's a particularly useful way of thinking of economic growth, or perhaps these capital augmenting forms. The problem is that this doesn't really capture what I have mentioned. In addition to lacking descriptive realism, what this way of formulating the production function implies is that when you make, for example, AL go up, you are making labor more productive in a lot of things, in everything that it does. And that's gonna create a huge productivity effect. And that productivity effect is going to have a number of implications that are actually counterfactual, including, as we'll see, that an improvement in AL or an improvement in AK will always increase wages. So you cannot have technological progress making people worse off. Well, we'll see that that's because of these pervasive productivity effects and not changes in the task content. Now, motivated by this, what we are aiming at is a production function like this. You can still keep the AL and AK, they're not gonna play an important role. But the more important thing is that there's gonna be this other element, let's call that gamma, which is going to be a summary measure of the task content of production. And critically, I'm going to argue that a lot of changes in technology, including those that fall into the banner under the banner of automation, are going to change this gamma, and they're going to have qualitatively and quantitatively very different implications. Without further ado, let me give a little bit more detail on this, and this is going to be the uh, essentially the only math slide. The, this and the next one are going to be the only math slides in the talk, and I don't mean to emphasize the mathematical details, but bringing a little bit of specificity here is useful because 
we'll see how this maps into the things that are probably more familiar to most economists. So at a sectoral level, you can think of this as the entire economy or just a sector. You can think of output as being com combined result of the task services, YZ. Sigma is the elasticity of substitution between tasks. And if you think as I did in the garment example that you need to perform all of these tasks, you should think of sigma as less than one. And in fact, empirical estimates suggest that it is less than one. So these tasks are highly complementary. This integral goes from n minus one to n. So which means that the measure is one when y I do it from n minus one to n will become clear in a second. The key is this equation here. You can produce these task services either with capital or labor, but you can use capital only if the tasks have been, if a task has been technologically automated. And I'm gonna think of tasks in this interval, so tasks less than I, as technologically automated. So you can use capital or labor. And tasks above I as technologically not automated, so you can only use labor. So if you use labor, this is the amount of labor you allocate to it. I allow for this labor augmenting term for comparison. And then gamma L is the specific productivity of labor in task V. If you can, if you have a task that is technologically automated, then you can also produce it with capital. In that case, either capital or labor. So it's the sum of what you produce with capital plus sum of what you produce with labor. And with capital, it's the same thing. This is the capital you allocate. This is the capital productivity. And this is the capital augmenting term. Now with this mathematical formalism, we can also visualize things in a graph, which I find particularly useful. So on the horizontal axis, I have the tasks. And on the vertical axis, I have the cost of production. What is the cost of producing a task with labor? Well, it's the wage divided by the productivity over one unit of labor allocated to that task, which is AL times gamma LV. This is the productivity of capital, and it stops at I because only tasks below I can be produced by capital. Cost minimization implies that you're gonna choose a lower envelope Very simple. So now with this graph, let's think of what labor augmenting technology does. It's an increase in AL, so it shifts this curve down in a parallel fashion everywhere. So what that means is that A labor augmenting technology means that technology is making labor more productive in all tasks. That's what I meant by, it's not really descriptively realistic. We don't have many technologies that will make you productive in everything you do. If you think of specific examples like computers, they may make you productive in a few things that you do. And you can also see that this is going to create a huge productivity effect because all of this blue area here is the improvement in terms of costs or improvements in terms of productivity. Same thing for capital augmenting technology. This is a capital augmenting technological change. Now capital becomes more productive in all of the tasks that it produces. <clears throat> what about automation? Automation, as I mentioned, is the technological process via which tasks that were previously performed by labor now can be performed by capital. So that's going to be a shift in I, say from I to I prime. You see that it's going to work very differently. And the amount of productivity gain it produces can be very small. It's going to be a triangle. It's the cost savings at the margin. And then finally, new tasks. Now we're going to add new tasks. So that can be very transformative because these new tasks could have very high productivity. 
or could be highly complementary to other things that we need. And I'll come back to that. In terms of solution to this model, here is what it looks like. Once you solve the model, which I'm not going to do, output can again be expressed as a function of labor and capital in the economies. And this looks very similar to a CES production function, the most common one that macroeconomists, labor economists, and finance economists use. But with a big difference, these terms that we normally ignore or are constant in the regular CES are now endogenous. And that's where the task allocation, the task content of production resides. In particular, if you look at what the labor share is, it can be expressed in this way. The blue terms are the ones that you are used to. Wage divided by AL to some power one minus sigma. And that's why sigma greater than one or less than one makes a difference when you look at the effects of labor augmenting or capital augmenting technologies. These are the blue terms that you are familiar with. But actually, <clears throat> there is a completely separate set of terms, the orange terms, that are almost separable from the blue terms. And that's where the task content of production comes in. So that's what I denoted by gamma. This gamma term is always decreasing in I and increasing in N. It looks a little complicated, but it's actually very simple. And for example, if you take sigma close to one or the gamma L and gamma K not to be very steep, it is approximately or exactly N minus I. More new tasks increase gamma, more automation reduces gamma. Also note that because gamma is monotone in I, automation always reduces the labor share regardless of the value of sigma. The fact that the effects of technology depends on sigma when you look at the, its impact on the labor share was I think a bit of a nuisance. That's not the case when you look at this task space and look at the effects of automation. What about labor demand? Well, let's look at it and we'll see that once you understand the previous slide, labor demand then follows immediately. So let's look at the wage bill, W times L. That's a comprehensive measure of labor demand. Well, that can be written as output times labor share. So I'm ignoring markups and non-competitive elements for now. We can come back to them later. And then let's imagine we look at the impact of automation. Well, that can be exactly decomposed into two terms, a productivity effect. This productivity effect here is positive. The more the greater is the productivity, the more you want to pay to labor because you want the more you want to hire labor. That's exactly this here. This is the productivity. How big is that green area is going to determine how big the productivity effect is. Could be big, could be small. But then there is the displacement effect, which is in orange, <coughs> because that's the one that's working through the task content of production. And it is always negative. Now, two implications. One of them we've already highlighted, but let me stress it again. Automation always reduces the labor share because of the displacement effect. The productivity effect keeps the labor share constant, displacement effect, boom, labor share goes down. But the more important implication is that the displacement effect can be easily greater than the productivity effect. So automation even though it's improving productivity, could actually reduce labor demand. Not just lower labor share, but lower labor demand. So the notion that comes from the neoclassical production functions that we use, that productivity improvements will translate into higher demand for labor and higher wages, that's not necessarily true. In particular, you can think of brilliant technologies, the ones that 
many people in the public uh, public uh, discussion and many people now in finance talking about AI, big data, et cetera, are talking about if there's a really very high productivity technologies, in contrast to what's sometimes claimed in the popular discourse, they will be not so bad for labor because they will create a large productivity effect. But the problem is what Pasquale and I call so-so technologies. They create large displacement effect, but small productivity gain. In that case, this one is close to zero and the displacement effect dominates. So it's the low productivity, not so productive technologies. And I'll come back to that again. Factor augmenting technologies, they don't create any of that displacement effect. They have a productivity effect that could be very large. Why? Because they are increasing the productivity of labor in all the tasks. That's why it scales with the share of labor or the share of capital. And then there is a substitution between the tasks produced by capital and labor. That's why sigma minus one comes in, but it works very differently than the task content changes that I have attempted. What about new tasks? New tasks work the opposite way to automation. They create a productivity effect, which could be large, but they also create a reinstatement effect because they create new tasks in which labor can be reinstated. Now with all of these, let's look at some data. This was the theory part. From now, the rest of the talk is gonna be data. I'm gonna look at data in light of these ideas and we'll show you hopefully some new and interesting patterns that will solidify the utility of looking at the data through these lenses and then reveal some interesting perspectives about the future of labor. Here I'm showing you where labor share declines comes from. This is 1947 to 1987, four decades after World War II. And you see this is the sort of period of more or less shared prosperity. For most of this period, labor share was constant, not just in the aggregate, but also within broad sectors, manufacturing, construction, uh, services, mining is the only sector in which you see some declines uh, and that's mining is a small sector. What about the last 30 years? This is when you see this decline in the labor share. But it's not everywhere. What you see is that in transport, there's a small decline. Services is mostly constant. Agriculture is constant. It's driven by manufacturing, that's the biggest one, and mining. Again, mining is small, but there's a big decline in labor share. So manufacturing and the effects of manufacturing technologies are gonna be critical if we want to understand what's going on with the labor share. So let's look a little bit more in detail. So what I'm showing you here is scatter plots. I'll come back to more causal like evidence in a second, but at different levels of aggregation, what I'm showing you that there is a correlation between industry level declines in the labor share and automation. So one measure of automation, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second is auto, uh, robots. The more robots a sector adopts, the more, the larger is the decline in labor share. And here, this is driven by manufacturing. The circles are non-manufacturing. They don't adopt much robots. These are industrial robots. But there's a lot of automation going on in non-manufacturing. It's related to routine tasks that are algorithmically automated. And you see that when you look at the share of routine tasks that are later automated. And here, now we're looking at about 400 more detailed manufacturing industries and more detailed measures of automation and again, the same thing. And then the new tasks, which are going to become more and more important as I go along in the, in the talk, well, they have, again, at a correlational level, the opposite correlation. The more new tasks there is in an industry, and there are many, various different ways of measuring either completely new tasks or tasks that did not exist in that industry or task structure changing in the industry. Those are the different panels. All of them are positively correlated with the labor share change. So at the correlational level, there's something about the nature of technology 
and the task content that seems to correlate strongly, especially within manufacturing, but more broadly with labor share. To look at that a little bit more in greater detail, I'll draw from the evidence uh, in my paper with <coughs> Pascual Restrepo on the effects of robots on jobs, where we create a measure for a local labor market proxied by a commuting zone in the US, we call exposure to robots. And essentially what we do is that we look at the robot penetration of an industry in other countries. That's especially relevant because US actually is a little bit of a laggard in robot adoption. So what happens in France or Germany is relevant to what's happening to US because they're farther ahead. And then in that local labor market, how much of the employment was an industry that then experienced robotization? So that's a Bartik measure based on baseline industry shares and industry-wide robot patterns. Indeed, this exposure to robots seems to be correlated with robotics activity. We don't have microdata. Well, we didn't have microdata. We now do from a new survey of the census that's just been completed. And there's a talk about this tomorrow. But if you wanna go back in history, you don't have good robot activity data at the commuting zone level, but a very creative paper by Lee and Kraft collected data on robot integrators, which are integral for robot activity. And you can see that exposure to robots is very strongly related to robotics activity. What happens when you have greater exposure to robots? So here I'm showing you the pattern for the 722 commuting zones and change in employment to population ratio between 1990 and 2007. <clears throat> the more exposed to robots a particular commuting zone is, the lower its employment growth. This is emblematically captured by the industrial heartland of the United States, Lansing City, Detroit, Wilmington, Defiance, and so on. But if you leave out those guys, you see the same slope applies and that's what the dashed line here is. So these are telling about what's going on but they're not driving the result. So this figure is very robust. Here you can control for whatever you want in terms of pre-trend or uh, other explanations such as offshoring or imports from China or Mexico there is a real robot specific aspect to this, that this relationship is capturing. So what it's saying in essence is that even though robots are one of the most important technologies for modern manufacturing, they have clearly increased productivity and we find that as well, employment and wages go down. And wages is the same thing as here. So it is very much what I showed you in the theory that Productivity goes up, but labor doesn't benefit. Actually, labor is harmed by the productivity increases because precisely robots are taking over tasks and changing the task content of production. And if you want to understand what's going on, you may want to look at which occupations are driving these declines in employment. Same thing in wages, but employment makes more sense. And it is exactly the routine and operator blue color occupations that I talked about a second ago. So it's exactly the occupations where robots are replacing is where the displacement is and where the decline in employment is coming from. But other occupations are not expanding to make up. So, These are emblematic of the effects of automation technology. But of course, one would really want to understand at a more micro level what's going on. And for that, you need more firm level data. <clears throat> and as I said, in the US, we don't have the firm level data, but in France, with the heroic work by Claire Lelarge, we were able to construct a comprehensive data set 
of robot adoption in French manufacturing using a variety of distinct data sources. And I'll now show you the patterns from there. So about 1% of firms purchased robots between 2010 and 2015 in France, but they are the large firms. So they make up 20% of total manufacturing employment or output. This is a different way of seeing that. If you look at the size distribution, these are the small unlisted firms. They don't adopt robots. So the robots are very relevant for the firms that you know, in many finance applications we focus on. And they are the, uh, this robot adoption is driven by this black firms, which are in industries that have these high average penetration that I showed you earlier on. So let me try to describe the data by reporting results from a regression. <clears throat> I'm gonna report outcomes at the firm level as a function of a variety of controls, firms own robot adoption, but for reasons that are gonna become obvious, we're also gonna look at adoption by competitors. And your competitors are the firms that produce in other sector, in sectors in which you are active. So these are four digit industries. And then for non-tradables, we also use commuting zone, but that doesn't really matter too much. Let me, start here, since I put so much emphasis on the labor share. So what this says is that if you adopt a robot within five years or within six years, your labor share declines by four and a half percent. That's a huge decline in France. I'll show you that in a second. So indeed, automation is associated with a decline in labor share. Again, the heart of the framework that I'm building. Robot adoption by your competitors doesn't affect your labor share. So your labor share is about your own production process and how the gains go to different firms within that. But here is the interesting thing. What happens to employment? Firms that adopt robots expand. Why is that? Well, it turns out that because robots are very productive, these firms are becoming more productive and they are growing as a result. You see that from the value added increases for these firms. But critically, when your competitors adopt robots, you contract. So what's going on is that robot adoption is good for the firm, but that's because the firm itself is able to substitute capital for labor, its production becomes more capital intensive, but it also expands, but it expands at the expense of its competitors. Now this all immediately tells you that there is something very critical about who is expanding and who is contracting in the industry. And that's actually related to this important paper by David Otter, Christina Patterson, Larry Katz, and John Van Rienen and David Dorn on superstar firms. And what they do is that in the US, <clears throat> they decompose the change in the labor share into a within firm change and a superstar effect, changing the covariance between labor share and value add. Well, you can do the same in France and you see exactly what they find, which is that this decline in the labor share is driven by the superstar effect. The within firm change, the unweighted average of the labor shares is not negative. It is this covariance that's important. But what they could not do in the US because there is no robots data in the US, now you can look, you can do in France, and you can try to understand what's going on with this superstar effect. And it turns out that it's largely because of robots. <coughs> in particular, most of this is accounted for firms that adopt robots and expand at the expense of other firms. Even though robots are just one of the many automation technologies and only 1% of the firms adopted, this reallocation driven by the productivity effects and the decline in the labor share of the firms that are adopting robots is so important that it explains most of the change. 
All right. So at the beginning, I talked about inequality. So far, I talked about labor share. Is this really related so critically to inequality? Well, let me briefly show you that it is. First of all, with the same commuting zone structure that I showed you from the papers on robots and jobs, we, can, we also estimate the effects on the entire distribution by quantiles. And you can see that robots or automation in general are inequality increasing. Wages go down in the lower quantiles and no effects actually slightly positive perhaps above the higher quantile. So automation affects the low wage workers. So that raises the issue or the question that perhaps a lot of things that we thought were due to either skill by technological change, perhaps partly trade and other things are also connected to the change in the content, task content of production. So for that, in new work, Pasquale and I extend the framework that I just presented by including many different types of labor. So other than that, everything is the same. It's just now that you have different types of labor. So some tasks can be performed by some labor, some type of labor or capital or other types of labor. So for instance, now focusing for <clears throat> diagrammatic illustration on two types of labor, high and low, these tasks are given to high skill. These tasks are given to low skill and these are to capital. So now what is automation? Automation is again an expansion of the set. But where is the set is gonna expand? It can expand in this direction or this direction. Well, since it's inequality increasing as I showed you, you may expect it to expand like this. And in fact, that turns out to be the empirically more relevant. So what we do is that we use this expanded framework and we derive a uh, general estimating equation for understanding inequality. <clears throat> Let me not get into the details too much. Of course, the devil in this case is, is definitely in the details. So this is more just giving a very high level summary, but under a very simple parameterization of this model and fairly general assumptions, you can show that the wages of a particular demographic group is going to depend on that group's task displacement. Defined as a Bartik measure of the change in industry labor shares times the exposure of a demographic group to the occupations that are being automated in that industry. So we construct a task measure and here it is in the data. This is 500 demographic groups differentiated by age group, education, gender, and race. And what you see is that groups that have higher task displacement, meaning that the tasks they used to perform in the industries in which they used to perform these tasks have been more likely automated, have had wage declines. They come predominantly from less than high school and the high school group. And those demographic groups where the tasks that they used to perform has not been, have not been automated have seen real wage increases from 1980 to 2015. In a regression framework, if you just put the task displacement measure in the regression for log hourly wages, it has huge explanatory power and nothing else much matters. But in particular, I wanna just spend one minute on this table because what we do here is that we take this task measure, task displacement measure, but we put it together with fairly flexible set of variables that capture the skill bias technological change. So essentially what we are saying is that we are allowing <clears throat> 
all educated workers, all some college workers, all high school workers, all full college workers to become more productive over time with their own AL terms like I did in the basic framework at the beginning. So it's a very flexible version of the skilled biotechnological chemical. And what you see is that the task displacement variable is again, very significant. And most of these variables are not significant. Now, if you didn't put the task displacement level variable, they would become significant because they are correlated with task displacement. So if you just run this regression, which is similar to what Captain Murphy did, for example, you would find a role for skill bias technological change. More educated groups are becoming higher wage over time. But that's precisely because this one is being absent in that regression. And even though you have a very fairly flexible parameterization of SPDC, it explains less than 10% of the changes in the US wage structure. And the task displacement variable by itself explains above 50%. So changing task structure seems to be critical for understanding changes in the wage structure. Okay. Well, I promised to say some things about the future of work. Well, let me then recap and tie it to the future of work. What I have argued so far is that in order to understand what's going on in US industries, <clears throat> employment wages and wage inequality, we need to think about this automation. But automation, as I said at the beginning has been with us. It goes back to the spinning and the weaving machines of the British Industrial Revolution, mechanization of agriculture, modern industries beginning. So really we need to think about why is it that automation is having these effects now and not before? And what was it that prevented it from having such effects? And the answer is that if you go back to the past, you see that Automation was counterbalanced by the introduction of new tasks. Whereas today we see an acceleration on automation, but more importantly, less new tasks. So I don't have time to go into great detail into this, but essentially the framework that <coughs> Pasquale and I developed can be applied to the data in a simple manner. And we can back out from there what's going on with displacement and reinstatement. And this is how it looks like in the four decades after World War II. The change in the task content in the aggregate is fairly flat around zero because there is a lot of automation but an automation is being counterbalanced by reinstatement. The same is true in manufacturing. Now move forward and look at the more recent period. What you see is that there is faster automation and the reinstatement has become much flatter. So an acceleration automation associated with a serious slowdown in reinstatement. In manufacturing, for example, In manufacturing, for example, you see the red line really going very fast to negative and reinstatement is very, very flat. And as a result, you see the task content in the economy, the orange is going against labor. And that accounts we find for most of the changes in the labor share. So why? Why would we see this adverse move against labor? against new tasks and in favor of automation? Well, to answer that question, you really need a framework with endogenous automation. And that's what Pasquale and I developed in our AER 2018 paper. And of course, I'm not gonna go through it other than to say that essentially, since you have these <coughs> I and N, really any endogenous technology model of automation and new tasks is gonna be a differential equation for I, the differential equation for N, and you have some resource, let's say, scientists who work in either developing new tasks or developing more automation technologies. And that's essentially the basic structure that we have. 
But think about it like this. The zero profit condition here is going to be a condition like this, or the innovation balance condition. You can make some profits from new tasks. You can make some profits from automation technology. And there is a task tax structure, subsidies or taxes on different things, on capital and labor, for example. And then you might also have some different expectations about what research in different fields are going to do. Those are the productivity of research in different areas. <clears throat> what we show in that framework is that there are natural equilibrating forces. More automation reduces the labor share that may make more new tasks more productive. But even though you have equilibrating forces, equilibrium that is balanced is not guaranteed and is not generally efficient. In particular, there are many reasons for inefficiencies, which may often take the form of excessive automation. And since time is short, let me not get into the details, but I wanna talk about two of them because they, I think, have resonance for finance crowd. And then I will conclude. The first is tax structure. <coughs> in the US, taxes favor capital. So in a recent Brookings paper, Pasquale Restrepo, Andrea Manera and I estimate the effective taxes on labor and capital. Here is his on labor, it's about 25%. In the 1990s on capital, especially on software and equipment capital, it was around 15 to 20%. But with very generous depreciation allowances and various other changes in the tax structure, it's been going down. And today it's less than 5%. So there's a big wedge between capital taxation and labor taxation. And what we show is that that encourages excessive automation. So one of the reasons why you may have this change is tax policy, but also visions matter. People may find automation more interesting or may fit into the business models of leading companies such as Google, Facebook, Netflix, and so on. So there are other sociological or social network reasons for excessive automation that are very interesting to study. And the problem is that all of this excessive automation is doubly costly. It's not just that it's excessive, but if you go back to <coughs> my discussion of so-so automation, it's so-so automation par excellence. This is excessive automation. It creates a negative productivity effect. So when that's the case, automation will necessarily reduce labor demand because it doesn't even generate the productivity. There's a double whammy on waste. In conclusion, I've tried to argue that both history and the current facts require a new richer perspective. Once you adopt it, it has a variety of implications about what has happened in the US labor market, but it also has implications about what might happen in the future. So this perspective has very different implications about the future of work. It doesn't say, like many economists still seem to assume, that somehow things are going to work out because technology is always for good for labor. It doesn't say, like some alarmists say, that the future will necessarily be workless and everything will be done by AI. It says that we could have different ways of developing technology platforms. We can have excessive automation or we can have automation coupled with new tasks. So we can have good automation or bad automation. Good automation is the one that increases productivity, but it's counterbalanced by other things we do that increase human productivity. Bad automation or social automation is that double whammy that I just showed. So very much it emphasizes that it's the corporate strategies, tax policies, and other firm level and society level choices that will determine the future of work. So which future it will be, that's actually up for grabs. Thank you very much. I think I have slightly exceeded the 45 minutes that I was aiming for, but I now look forward to the questions and comments that you have. Thank you. Excellent, Jerome. Thank you very much. Um, 
Okay, I'm going to uh, start off with a high level sort of question. Do you have any uh, advice for introductory resources or textbooks for people who are new to this area who you know, enjoyed your talk and wanted to get started doing some research in the area? Well, unfortunately, no. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I'm guilty as charged. Uh, in 2007, I published a book on introduction to modern economic growth, and none of this material is in there because guilty as charged, like the standard perspective, I thought, well, the simplest framework is AL and AK, and that's the one I will stick with in, a, in an introductory graduate textbook. But now, if I were to write that textbook again, I would put much more emphasis. So an introduction to this is given in, uh, the, for example, the uh, Journal of Economic Perspectives article that I wrote with Pasquale uh, and published last year called Automation and New Tasks. Uh, and, uh, and that sort of spells out at a very low basic level sort of the math and the conceptual points. Okay. Uh, here's you. another one kind of building from where you ended, I think. Uh, if you were gonna make a prediction for 10 years from now that we could test your, your theory on, or, or at least tr the trends based on your theory, what would, what would that be? So what do you anticipate? In the next decade, I I don't know because you know as I just indicated at the end, it's really up for grab. I can make a prediction based on current trends continuing, and that wouldn't be very appetizing. I think a different way of saying what I try to articulate at the end is that we have essentially adopted the business model of a handful of companies, big tech in particular, as the technology policy of the US. And if that continues, we will do more and more automation and not enough new tasks. And that I think will be quite bad for labor. Labor share will continue to decline and opportunities for labor and inequality will increase. But that's not preordained. We could make different choices and the new sort of energy that antitrust and other uh, government regulatory policies are gaining may say perhaps we might redirect technological change. We have successfully redirected technological change, for example, when it comes to renewable energy, it could be possible in other domains as well. Okay. All right. Here, I'm going to ask now some of the other questions in sort of the order they were asked, meaning they'll probably line up with roughly the order of your presentation. Uh, Rick asked a question in that graph you had on real wages. There was a sort of an inflection point around 1980 um, and the separation as well as the, the uh, growth in one and, and reduction in another. What do you, was there, that kind of seems like a specific event may have occurred rather than some gradual trend. Do you, can you attribute that to any kind of specific event? No, I don't think so. It does look like a <clears throat> real inflection, but depends on which data set you use. Okay. So if you look at the May CPS, it looks very inflection point like. If you use the March CPS, it looks like it started a little bit earlier and it's smoother. You know, the the one big event around there is the, you know, uh, <clears throat> Reagan, Reagan economics and uh, uh, air controller strikes defeat. But I don't think that's the really turning point, although obviously the shifts against labor have an institutional dimension as well. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if this is the same graph, but another person asked a question here about um, explain, okay, if I'll read it to you. Could you explain the employment polarization diagram, which I'm thinking might be the real wages, but I'm yeah. not sure. No, the it's the next one, yeah. Okay. And explain why your theory would explain growth in low wage occupation employment starting in 2000 and not before, and though you didn't show it, not since about 2012. Right. Uh, so essentially, the theory is a bit silent on that. So what happens is that if you agree with the sort of the verbal argument I gave that many of the automated jobs are in the middle, what's going to happen is that you're going to dislocate these workers. So these workers need to go somewhere. Where are they going to go? They can go to lower occupations or the higher occupations. In the theory, where they will go depend on the steepness of the comparative advantage schedules on the left and the right. If the 
if the one on the right is very steep, then they will all go into the low wage occupation. And essentially, you know, if you look at the US data, uh, the number of postgraduate and college graduates hasn't increased all that much since the 1980s. So then the high wage occupations growing would require that workers who were previously in the middle occupations would go there. And it looks like many of them went to the lower occupations. Okay. How would you think about the British Industrial Revolution, textile manufacturing, and the power loom in light of your theory? Yeah, I think this is very much one of the motivating facts spinning machines and weaving machines, you cannot think of them as labor augmenting and you cannot think of them as capital augmenting either because if it's capital augmenting, it will make capital more productive in everything. And that's clearly not what happened. What happened is exactly that a group of workers, the skilled artisans, the spinners and the weavers got <clears throat> dislocated. And in fact, very similar to what we're experiencing today, there wasn't much of a wage growth. That's the old living standards debate or paradox and what more recently Bob Allen called Engels pose. It took about 50 or 60 years for labor demand to grow enough that real wages started growing. Nobody understands why that happened. But I think what this perspective would suggest is that these new tasks, new organizations that really fueled labor demand came much later. Okay. Um, here's a question about um, Shifting jobs to robots are one thing. Another would be to China or India, a low rate, low wage country, could um, shifts towards uh, you know outsourcing of jobs, if you will. Explain some of these trends that you were talking about. Absolutely, very very important, and obviously both of those are very very important. <clears throat> In particular, there is direct imports. Those won't change the task content, and we control for them in the regressions. And I worked on that together with David Otter, Gordon Hansen, and David Dorn, and their work is fantastic. But that doesn't affect, and the industries that are affected by the China trade are very different from those that are really at the forefront of robotic automation, for example. Offshoring, which is some of the tasks being offshored as intermediate imports, that would look like the changes in task content. And it is part of the story, but again, in a regression analysis, those seem to be less important than automation related changes, but it's certainly important as well. Okay. Um, what about quality? Do you think the quality of output stays the same or changes in some way with the adoption of robots? Great question, I don't know. I don't know for sure. We worried about that. In France, we were fortunate enough to have very good export data and almost all of the robot adopters are exporters. So we could look at prices and quantity. So what we find in the data is that robot adoption is associated with a sizable increase in TFP. And we investigated whether that's because of a price change, which would be quality, for example, or whether it's a, due to a quantity change. So even though I suspect like the question uh, the, the, asked by, uh, by this participant, that quality must be part of it, what we found is that there isn't a change in price, but there's a big quantity change. So that suggests that at least not all of it is quality. It's that production process. Right, right. Okay. Um, what about the supply of labor, just the world population, increasing number of workers? What role could that play, uh, you know, through your theory or just in general with these trends? Yeah, so uh, the world population, that's gonna work through trade and again, <clears throat> That's important, but it won't show up as changes in the task content of production. It won't change the labor share per se. Uh, it may have a second order effect, but we control for that. Uh, within the US, what we find is that actually participation has been declining, of course, as people know, but the participation decline is driven almost entirely by the same groups who are experiencing the tasks that they used to perform being automated. So it is very related to this automation task displacement process that I went through. Okay. Um, this question might go back to the, we sort of talked about it a minute ago, but I'll ask it. 
if history is the guide, should we observe more new tasks being created in the longer term, given that we haven't seen so many new tasks um, in the recent decade? I don't know. That's a great question. That's exactly what I'm wondering about. You know, if you think of AI as a new technology platform, it is capable of creating a lot of new tasks in education, healthcare, services, entertainment, communication. But <clears throat> I think it depends on what we do with that technology platform. And that goes back to the comment that I made. I think the business models of companies that are at the forefront of new technology at the moment is not conducive to new tasks. It's much more based on algorithmic automation. So that's why I think government regulation and intervention is important. Okay. Um, Darone showed that firms could gain, firms could gain from automation even if a worker doesn't benefit. Couldn't the same problem arise at the country level? Countries could gain from automation even though at the global level, workers lose. If so, what policy implications would you draw at the country and at the global level? Fantastic question, 100%. Uh, I had a bullet point on that in the last slide I didn't talk about. That's why I called automation an inappropriate technology for developing countries. So <clears throat> there is evidence <clears throat> that automation is associated with reshoring. So American workers may not gain all that much, may lose, but really the workers who are losing out are going to be those in Vietnam, Indonesia, or Mexico. And there is evidence building up that's the case. And the problem is, of course, there's no policy remedy for that. You know, sovereign nations, they make their own decisions and actually developing countries are not even aware of this problem as a major one. It's not up in their agenda. Okay. Um, can you give an example of so-so automation? Self-checkout kiosks. So, I don't so think anybody expects them to revolutionize production or increase productivity. They're very annoying <laughs> for many people. They save labor costs, but they're not really gonna increase labor demand all that much. Okay. Uh, how much, uh, let's see. I see Eric Rindra has- uh, Yeah, yeah, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Let me see. Oh, could the ASA, ASSA support person tell us how we, uh, recognize somebody who's raising their hand. Well, I'm going to keep going until we figure that out. Um, sorry, now, Daron, these are new questions I haven't read yet, so that's why I'm going a little slower. Sorry about that. Uh, care work is difficult to automate. What if society invests heavily in care work for the very young and the very old? I think that's definitely part of it. Look, education is another area which I think some parts of it are very easy to automate. You can have algorithms do the grading <clears throat> and you can have MOOCs and other things that eliminate teachers, but actually real effective teaching requires a lot of human contact and you can have a lot of new tasks, much more uh, teaching to the needs of specific types of students. Uh, I think those are all things that we could do, but it would require resources and it would require a redirection of technological change. I agree. Okay. Uh, do your results imply no or very little role for other, for other explanations of the loss of labor share? For instance, globalization and the shift of manufacturing production to lower labor cost countries. So, uh, the decomposition that I very quickly glossed over is very specific on certain things, not so on others. The composition effects seem to be very small. So there doesn't seem to be any support for the Bormol cost disease type of explanation. But offshoring could be quite important. You know, again, in a regression sense, offshoring explains less than automation, but it's certainly present. Okay. Um, you've also written about political economy in your most recent book, A Narrow Corridor, which James Robinson touches on this. How does the economics you're describing today interact with political economy? What, if anything, can we do to improve things? Okay, do I have another hour? <laughs> 
Well, I mean, I think one concern I have, I'm trying to sort of work on that, but it's not <coughs> something I have completed, is that if part of the reason why we have a redistributive society is because labor is essential, as automation makes labor less essential, that may undermine the redistributive foundations of society as well. So I think there are major implications for political economy. Okay. How would excessive automation enter into a standard growth model with endogenous technological progress? Uh, well, that is uh, that is something we actually address in that AER paper that I referred to. It's one of the extensions where we show one channel for excessive automation working through labor market wages. And we sort of show, show that sort of, it may be so excessive that it may not have a balanced growth path. You may go to a corner or you can have a balanced growth path, but inefficiently biased towards automation. I think there are some interesting issues and we could get into the details, but let me refer you to the paper not to take more time. All right. Have you looked uh, explicitly or in detail at the manufacturing industries, textiles, metals, and the uh, sharp drop since the 2000s for manufacturing um, of, of labor share? Is, do you think it's all automation or do you think there's other things going on too? Look, I, I don't know. I think we need to look into that more. Uh, I certainly think that changes in the distribution of rents has been important as well, but that may be related to automation too, that automation may have been one of the elements that has reduced labor's bargaining power. But from a correlational point of view, the decline in the labor share is driven by either sectors that have automated a lot or sectors that have offshored a lot within manufacturing. Okay. Um, back to the so-so innovations, uh, is there a definition of them other than uh, those that lower labor share? So in other words, yeah, if you want to identify them. Yeah, no, no, the definition is those that don't increase productivity much. Okay. Sorry, I wasn't clear on that. So that green triangle that I showed you, that's very small, of course, you know, how small is small, but, you know, in the, okay. in the margin, if that green triangle is infinitesimal, that's the so so technology ideal type. Okay. Uh, you made a key distinction between internal investment in automation and when competitors invest in automation. What if the government or some decentralized uh, entity, uh, excuse me, or some de decentralized were to be the entity investing in automation and making it open access? How would that change the trends for the future of work? Would that create more novel tasks, et cetera? Yeah, great question. I don't know. I think new tasks probably requires a lot of investment in different ways of using technological knowledge. But even automation is not such an automatic process. The fact that you know only large firms are at the front of automation. And that seems to be true, not just for robotics, for other forms of automation from this new data in the US that I've mentioned, uh, that's sort of what we find there, uh, suggests that there are organizational barriers to automation as to many new technologies. And, you know, let me reiterate that I'm not arguing automation is always bad. Automation increases productivity and automation has always been with us. Our purpose, in this narrative, not to say automation is bad, but automation needs to be coupled with other technologies. So productivity gains from automation are great, but we need other things so that there is also labor demand generated for humans. Yeah. I'm gonna combine a few questions. There's several questions about the role of government essentially. And I'll just, I'll put this in real topical terms. If you were advising the Biden administration, uh, what, what role should government play in these issues? Like what would be advice you would give for the next four to eight well, years? Well, I think, I think uh, one advice, which is 
probably controversial among some economists, but <clears throat> based on the chart that I showed you at the end, is that, you know, I would say we should go back to the tax structure from the 1990s, where capital and labor are in more balanced taxation. That would be good for raising more revenues. And it would be good for eliminating tax incentives for adopting machines. Some companies, if they do debt financing and they're S corporations, they actually get about three or 4% back in net from the government when they automate. Now, on top of that, I think we need to rethink our innovation strategy, and that's much harder. But I think it's necessary, and it was successfully done, for example, for renewables, but the devil's in the detail in that one. Right. How about training, reschooling, anything like that? Oh, yeah. Uh, if, you, <clears throat> if you have a biased tax structure that favors capital, it also discourages investment in humans. So at the very least, you should treat investments in humans, training and so on, in the same way, in the same generous terms as investments in physical capital, but probably other things are necessary as well. Um, so you, you know, some of your graphs and your, your narrative um, explained clearly that Manufacturing effects on manufacturing and in the service industries, maybe there's been some shift towards that. Um, do you kind of anticipate though the same things going to be happening with service industries that happen to uh, manufacturing? Absolutely. Industry? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there is a lot of automation in services already, but the reason why you don't see that downward trend in services is because we actually also created a lot of new tasks and services. So when I showed you that positive relationship between new tasks and labor share, that was because some service industries were creating all these emerging tasks. So if we go down the path of AI as an automation technology, and again, AI does not need to be an automation technology. AI could be something very different than automation technology. But if we use it as an automation technology, then we'll see the same thing in service. Okay. Uh, let me see here. What are your views on what automation means for aging societies? Does aging Fantastic slow down? Question. Pardon me, go ahead. Fantastic question. So actually Pasquale and I have another paper on demographics and automation. And in fact, that's the, a fantastic example of good automation. So in places like Germany, Japan, South Korea, there's a real shortage of labor and automation has been at the forefront of dealing with that. And in fact, cross countries, about 40 to 50% of the variation in automation is explained by demographic change. Okay. Let's see, I'm having a hard time keeping up with so many questions coming in, which is great. Um, ah, well, if you, have, uh, if, you, if you have views on this, what are the most important implications for this research on asset pricing, asset bubbles, asset pricing theory, et cetera? I was hoping that people would be intrigued to investigate those questions. Obviously, any technology that has major implications on the capital share of income will have implications for future dividends and returns on capital, and therefore it will have implications for asset prices. So I think you know many of the models of asset prices are also dependent on the way in which we assume technology comes into the production function. So I think it will have implications, but I haven't worked them out. I hope people who are experts in that area will. What would you look for for clues on whether the most recent trends are temporary or permanent? Great question, I don't know. I think they are, they have been going on for, you know, two and a half decades at least. So, they're not a blip, but I think whether they are permanent or not will depend on policy and social choices. Look, again, I will give the example. It's a bit trite because I've said it three times already, but it's like climate change. If you look at it from the vantage point of the 1980s, you would say climate change is inexorable and it will go worse and worse. And it has gone worse and worse in some dimensions, but we have also brought renewable technologies to a cost effectiveness with fossil fuel. How have we done that? Well, because society changes demands for 
different types of energy from cars to home energy and research changed a lot. We poured billions of dollars into renewable energy. So I think the future is up for grabs in that respect. What is your prediction about what will happen to the education industry? Good question, I don't know. I mean, we, we will, we have, we are, education industry is one of the sectors that has least been affected by AI and by algorithms in some sense. But Zoom is just one example showing that we're going to be using technologies in very different ways. Zoom is actually is not an automation technology. It's actually clearly augmenting what we do as humans. But imagine we can also find ways of algorithmically replacing many of the things that we do from grading to lecturing to uh, comments. You know, there are applications of AI in other fields already that, uh, that you can take out the trainer and AI programs can give advice to novices. So you could go down that way. I don't think that would be a great way for the education sector to go, but it's gonna be a choice that of educators as well as of governments and the technology sector. Okay. Let's go back to kind of like international um, perspective. If let's say you have China and Germany um, using a lot of robots, what, what would you think the U.S. could do relative to that? Is there any sense that the U.S. can choose not to automate as much or is that a futile? Can I take the fifth on that one? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's a really thorny question. Uh, it's the same question that arises with other applications of AI. If, you know, China or Saudi Arabia or Iran or Russia fuel the use of AI as a technology for repressing people, you know, what can other countries do? Once the technology is out there, you know, Germany will adopt it, UK will adopt it, some US agencies will adopt it. It's the same thing with automation technologies. That's why international coordination is important and may be very, very difficult to achieve. On the other hand, you know, European Union and the US are big players. GDPR, you know, not a unalloyed success, but a very important step. You know, European Union did that, you know, against the wishes of the US and China. All right, I'm gonna wrap it up with two, two questions for you. One would be, um, you know, we just asked you a lot of questions from all different angles, and some of them kind of have negative, negative uh, answers because uh, it's a big trends that are hard to to fight against. Is there any kind of optimistic? Uh, you know, what's a positive spin you can put on this? Uh, well, the positive spin is that AI, again, as a technology platform, is so broad and so rich that you can use it for so many things. I don't think. I don't view AI as a natural automation technology. It could be really an enriching technology. So I think that's the positive spin. If we want to use it for other things, we can use it for other things. And then are there two or three topics that you would leave a bunch of finance professors with that you think are real important in this space to do, do research on? We just don't know the answers to the questions. Yeah, I think, I think what I would, you know, that's why I wanted to mention that at the very end, but I ran out of time. I think the part that I believe is central, but is extremely raw, unexplored, is what corporate strategies and the competitive, competitive advantages of different firms imply. You know, what's your business model? Where does that business model come from? What does that imply? You know, is there something about the current business models of large corporations? that says that they are going to go more in the automation direction or can they change? I think those are really questions that finance faculty and researchers are best placed to explore. And I think they are going to be central for our understanding of the future of technology and the future of work. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. This has been really fascinating and uh... That was a surprising number of questions you got at the end. So that's a real good sign. Uh, we peaked out at about 315 uh, participants. So that was might be a new record for this year too. So thanks a lot, Jerome. We know you're very busy. We really appreciate your time. And thanks to all the attendees uh, for coming and asking all those questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, John. It was a true 
pleasure to be part of it and, and I'm honored to have been invited. And thanks to everybody for the fantastic questions. Sure thing. All right, we'll sign off then. Thank you very much.